This video is basically a massive dump of every single advanced technique that I know of in clock solving. Partly because my old videos were kind of bad, and also because I found new optimizations along the way. I'll be doing my explanations using my somewhat flexible pin order, but these techniques are applicable to yours as well. You just need to understand why it works. My edge pin order is flexible so that I can optimize my solution. It goes like this. My corner pin order is not flexible because you can't really optimize it. It goes like this. There are a few optimizations in this video that I don't actually use myself because it's risky and wouldn't save me much time, but you might decide to use them in your solves anyway. Also quick disclaimer, you can definitely figure all of these techniques out yourself and it's a very satisfying feeling discovering them without any help. So if you'd like to get that feeling, stop watching this video and go experiment. For edges, one thing that you should be doing is going through your entire edge solution in your head for both sides to see if you'll end up with a skip. How I do this is I look at where the center clock needs to go to align with the U clock and the D clock must also make the same move. In this case, the center needs to go back two, so D will also go back two, like this. The same thing happens with these two. The center needs to move forward two to match with L, so R moves in the same direction and goes up here. Now that I know where the D and R clocks are, I'll know I have a skip if they match to the same dial or if either matches to the 12 dial. Of course, if they match the 12, you want to solve that side first because it doesn't count as a skip on the second side because of the corners. If they match to the same dial, my pin order wouldn't change. So you might ask why bother predicting it? Well, it's so that during execution, I know that I'm going to skip a move and I don't have to pause to recognize it. As a side note, I trace purely visually and it only takes a bit of practice to get used to. I don't recommend doing math because I always remember the first move I need to make on the second face and I don't want to mix anything up. In this scramble, I can see that when I align this to this, this will go to 12, and when I align this to this, this will go here. So I should do this side first. When I align this to this, this will go here, and this with this, this will go here as well. So these two will be connected, and I'll skip a move as well. And I just have to remember that. So here, go there, here, that skipped. Interestingly, it doesn't matter which way you hold the clock. If you have a 12 alignment skip from one side, you'll have it on any side. And the same goes for the other skip. If they match up on this side, then they'll match up on any other side as well. Adding on to this technique, sometimes I'll be tracing through when I realize that if I replace my first move with a DL and DR pin move, I can force R to align to 12, like this. This is a bit harder to see in inspection, but practice will do it. Now, sometimes I'll get a scramble where I can see that if I do a DR pin move, I can force a skip. But this move is not part of my pin order at all, and it's very risky, so I avoid it altogether. You might also get this case where after your first move, D and R might also match up. This is why it's important to trace. Had I not predicted that my next move would be a UL move, I would have hesitated. Another reason why tracing is good is because during inspection, my right thumb is most comfortable in this position. It blocks a lot of the R clock, and I would need to shift it or position it awkwardly throughout the solve, which I don't like. Other than that, if I'm not sacrificing any skips, I generally prefer to have the harder face to solve first so that I can mentally prepare. I want to preface this section by saying that I didn't discover this technique, but rather I learned it from Lo Yun Hao. However, the fact that he only uses X2 flips significantly limits the full capability of it, as you'll see later. For a corner to be skipped on the second face, there must not be any move that breaks apart the corner from the edge, like this. You can check where skipping possibilities are by doing one moves on, in your pin order on a solved clock. For me, the skips are here and here. However, that's only for full step solutions. 
Here, I'll try the same, but with this skip. As you can see, there's also a corner skipping possibility here. Now that we know where these skips can occur, here are the two possibilities on the first face that can allow for this skip to be preserved. The first possibility, and the most common one, is that you don't turn the clock at all on the first face. Because corner clocks are the same on both sides, by not turning it on one side, its position will be unaffected on the other side. Because edges are unique on both sides, it will not have changed on the other, and thus they will remain intact. You just need to make sure that you can complete the first face without turning that specific corner. Now this is where you need to check if this is possible or not without sacrificing any edge skips in the process. In this scramble, because I need to do an R move using this pin, this will be disconnected after finishing. On the other hand, in this scramble, we have this skip with this case. And if we put it here, we can skip it because there's no edge skip that we're sacrificing to preserve it. The second possibility is that the corner does move, but it ends up where it originally was after the first face is done. Here, we have this skip. These two moves don't affect the corner, but now these three clocks are facing 12. If we finish off the face using turns where the, where the corner does move, like this, all the clocks around this pin will, res will return to the original state before those last three moves, and this will be preserved. As you can imagine, this is much rarer and I don't get to use it very often, but it is good to keep in your arsenal. There is one technique that I know can be used, but isn't practical given only 15 seconds of inspection. You can force a corner skip even when there is none in the scramble. By planning your entire first phase, it's possible for you to track each of the turns of each of the corners and figure out whether or not they end up skipping anything on the other side. From that, you can decide which flip would allow you to preserve that skip during inspection on the second phase. That being said though, you can do a simpler version like this. Here I can predict that the turn for the first corner of my second phase will be a plus 5 which is the worst possible turn for me because I'll be executing it with my left index finger. I can avoid that turn by making sure that my DR pin is up while aligning the first cross. Furthermore, if the turn for aligning the first cross is a minus five, I'll know that the corner is skipped, although this information wouldn't be too helpful. Here's something else that I could utilize but don't. When I get this skip, I know that I can skip it by doing a Y2 flip, but because these flips are risky for me and I'm not used to them, I don't usually do them. Although I am trying to incorporate them into my solves when I get two or more potential skips. Now you might be asking, if I have the choice between an, a corner and an edge skip, which one should I choose? And my answer to that question is you should choose the edge skip. If you do the edge skip, there is a possibility that you could get the same corner skip on top of the edge skip whereas choosing the corner skip doesn't provide you with any possibilities for the edge skip. When you're given no visible skips in inspection, I go to both sides and look for turns I can execute easily with my thumb. The hierarchy goes something like this, but this is my personal preference. I like to keep the best turn on the second phase so that I can mentally prepare for the worst turn before I begin. Pins also play a major role here, but it's hard to describe how I plan when they are a factor, so just experiment and find what works best for you. In this scramble I'd probably put this on the second face and do this first so that I can do that really easily. As previously mentioned I like to trace through my full first face solution so I am prepared for any skips coming my way. There is one case though, which I executed a bit differently to what you might expect. Here, I think that executing this like this is just objectively bad. Instead, you should take advantage of the fact that clock is commutated and solve that, then align this 12, and then finish off. Normally that would save you f having to press four pins at once, but if you get something like this, then I would put this on the second phase 
and just have to do that. That's really the only case where changing the pin order could be a bit faster, but it is worth keeping in mind. There's really not much else to add here. This is where the action happens. On the second face, you might get this case, where the DR corner is connected to the D edge after your first turn. Although I'm still working on incorporating this into my solves, you, sh you should slightly alter your pin order like this to preserve that. You might come across a similar case where it's with these two clocks instead. You can preserve it by doing this. Your corner pin order should begin with solving opposite corners first. This gives you two skipping possibilities on your second pair. The first possibility is where one of the pin, uh, clocks matches 12, in which case you would do this. The second possibility is that both of the clocks are facing in the same direction, and you can just do that. Both these skips can occur together, and you can finish the solve like this, which is very satisfying. Now for your first pair, if you don't have one of the corners solved already, you should solve it like this because it's hard to predict whether or not the pair will be pointing to the same dial on your last move of the edges. However, in general, you shouldn't solve the last pair like this, unless if you can visibly see a skip, because there's a chance that you'll skip this 12 alignment if you don't. You can force better turns if you do it like this, but it comes at the risk of you also skipping that 12 alignment. I do find it quite interesting that both finishing edges on the first face and finishing corners on the second face both give you optimization options when you align to 12 or if both of them are on the same dial. So that is literally everything I know about Clock. I am very surprised that there are so few videos on Clock on YouTube, and I really hope that the Clock pros aren't keeping these techniques a secret on purpose, and I'm just giving all this top secret info out to the public. Anyways, high effort shit post over, have fun.